Hey y'all, Chatty Kathy here. Happy Wednesday again. So we've been talking a lot about sugar lately, this whole month of April. What a trying month for me to be able to learn all this stuff over again and more stuff without getting upset or cussing. <laughs> yeah, that didn't happen at all, you know. So last week we did fake sugar and some of those words are really, really hard to pronounce. But now at least you have some kind of thought process, a different thought process on what these other words are. So you know that they're not good for you, right? They're made in a, a lab and your practitioners are just making sure that you don't have a rise in your blood sugar and that you're getting your sweet stuff that you want. So don't get mad at them because they have no idea. Your tr nutritionists don't know really because they're taught these things. Oh, we do the fake sugars, so the diabetics don't have a rise in their sugar. So, you know, people with cancer, maybe it'll help them also. I'm not sure, but don't get mad at them, okay? So with all the podcasts that we've done since February, you should be feeling great by now. What have you decreased? What have you totally stopped within your diet? What have you helped your family with? Comment below, please let me know. Please let me know and, and I, I love all your texts and everything, I totally appreciate it. So happy Wednesday. Today we're gonna to talk about sugar problems. Or is it a sugar problem or is it an insulin problem? Only a rising epidemic and it's affecting children and adults alike. We're gonna be talking about what diabetes is, what happens inside your body, okay? So first, I'm gonna repeat again and again, many, many times, you have to tell your doctor or your practitioner what you're learning and what you're doing for your life, for your new life, right? You have to work together. You have to let your doctor know that you're changing your input for your microbiome so you have healthier habits, right? You need to tell them, please, please, we need all aspects of our healthcare team. We need the practitioners. We need health insurance companies to make sure things don't go cray cray. We need our pharmaceutical companies, absolutely. We need big food companies to make sure that we're all fed, but we need to make sure that they know that we don't need everything sweet. Healthy life team, absolutely, I love that word. Anyway, also to let you know, that the medications that your doctors prescribe for you and the medications that you can get over the counter or your chemotherapy medications or the other therapies that you do are not going to work like they're supposed to unless you take care of you unless you take care of your nutrition that's the basis pretty much of everything besides energy but we'll talk about that in a different podcast. So no matter what your doctor does to try to help you, if you don't work on your side of it, it's not gonna work as well, right? And you could get sicker and I don't want that, right? Listen, people, you know that's not right. You cannot let them do everything for you. You need to change yourself too to be healthier. And now you know some of the foods and drinks that are not good for you, right? We've been doing this for a little while now. You can't say that you don't know. You cannot say that you don't know, unless you haven't watched the podcast. Please watch the podcast. Love, like, subscribe, and share. That would be so awesome. Even big food companies, like I said earlier, are realizing that there is indeed a huge, huge problem, but we can all work together to change the ill health of all people, and that's all people too. So remember, you gotta help out your doctors, to help out your disease process, you, my friends, my loves, need to make that change, please. You need to eat and you need to drink healthier energy or fuel sources for your body. You know what that means? Comment below, you know, it means fix your sugar. Fix your sugar, right? Yes, the difference is the reason. Fix that sugar. Let me say it again. The difference is the reason you have to help. You have to help. You have to be the head honcho, like I said before in one of my other podcasts, right? Over 20 years ago, they knew that food with high sugar contents, whether it's natural sugar or whether it's man-made sugar in a lab, causes many, many health problems. And that's when they started adding sugar to our foods because, ooh, they'll buy more and they'll eat more. 
And then that little bit of sugar that they were putting in there wasn't enough. So we start adding sugars in there. Then they start adding other sugars in there so they can say other things. No. And like I said, over the last 10 years or so, it's been affecting our children, our babies, our babies. Back in the year 2000, the American Diabetic Association knew that the rise in diabetes in children ages 9 to 19 years old and in adults was getting worse. All type 2 diabetic cases were getting worse. And I'll explain the difference between the two in a little while. And in the year 2020, they predicted an epidemic of diabetes and sugar problems or insulin problems, whatever it is. And guess what? We're here. We're here. Look at the statistics. Comment below. I've looked at them so many times. It's, it's just unbearable and so sad. Diabetes and pretty much any disease possibly might be more preventable, of course, if you catch it early. And if you treat your body with respect, over 60% of type 2 diabetes is preventable. And I'm going to say that again because I've read many. Over 60% of type 2 diabetes is preventable. And I've read from a couple doctors, 100% preventable. Ooh, if I'm not good, you know, my mom, my grandma, my dad, everybody had diabetes, I could get it. But it's your lifestyle, right? Diabetes type 2 is not from genetics. Type 1, yes, possibly an autoimmune disease. But type 2, no. Even with a moderate intake, like I told you before in the other sugar lectures, 5 to 9 teaspoons a day will still cause metabolic diseases and chronic problems. Sugar is in all foods and maybe a little bit is necessary, but I don't think so. I don't think it is. It does not need to be in every single food that we buy, right? You my loves and the food companies are adding sugars to your diet and like i said often in large amounts this is not good so large amounts of sugar can cause beta cell exhaustion and the beta cells are in your pancreas so those are the ones that make our hormone insulin and insulin is very important because it gets the the sugar or our fuel into the cells right but if your pancreas is working so hard because you have sugar spikes all the time oh my goodness beta cell exhaustion is going to happen Right? And that's a contributing factor to the development of type 2 diabetes. In 2015, the government said that dietary guidelines for sugar should be probably less than 10%. 5% is a little bit better. We're getting so much more than that. So much more than that. It's can't, it can't be possible with the processed foods that we're eating every day, that we're feeding our children every day with every meal. Right? And there's many excuses, I know. Comment below, there's many excuses, but there's so many more excuses just to take just a little bit more time and eat something healthier, right? Remember that everything that you consume eventually turns to sugar or glucose. That's the good sugar, right? That's what you want because that's what your body can use for the most part. It can use other fuels also. So do you have a sugar problem? Are you a diabetic? Or do you have an insulin problem? Diabetes is an insulin problem. It's not a sugar problem. It is an insulin problem. Either you have too much and you can't use it, or you're not making any at all, or you're hardly making any. But anyway, your body doesn't recognize it, right? It's only a sugar problem because that's what you're using as your fuel. Diabetes is an insulin problem. It's a sugar problem because that is what you are feeding your body to get your energy. Now, type 1 diabetes, you usually get earlier in life. It could be in genetics. It could be environment, right, from infections. It's an autoimmune disease, so your body kind of inadvertently and accidentally attacks your pancreas, and then your pancreas can't make the insulin that your body needs so you can use that sugar, so you can get that fuel, right? Type 2 diabetes, your body really does not recognize your insulin. So you kind of become resistant to it, right? Now there's actually two types of diabetes, type 2, 2, 2, 2, ones with high insulin, <clears throat> excuse me, which is insulin resistance. And there's actually a low insulin diabetes, which is kind of the worst kind, right? And it's very, very difficult to treat. So with 
low insulin diabetes, you can't use the sugar because you just don't have enough insulin. So you, your pancreas can make the perfect amount and your body can recognize it. Your pancreas can make none, and then you have to take it. Your pancreas can make a little bit and maybe you can use a little bit, but for the most part, it's not recognize it or it's a resistance to it, right? There's a couple different types. But with low insulin diabetes, you can't use the sugar because you don't have enough insulin to put that sugar into your cells. So your body has fuel and energy. With high insulin diabetes, which I said is insulin resistance, you have the sugar and you have the insulin available, but you are not recognizing your insulin anymore. You're just not responding to what your pancreas is doing. So both cases, you have high sugars floating around in your body and that's not good. Both types, like I said, elevate your sugar levels in your body. You know how big sugar molecules are? They mess up everything. To people with diabetes, you know, have eye problems, how small the vessels are in there, and feet problems, the wounds don't heal, how small the vessels are there. Those sugar molecules are huge, right? And let me tell you, these symptoms do not just happen overnight. They happen and develop over years and years. Just don't say, oh, I've been healthy, and all of a sudden I became a diabetic. No, you did not. No, you did not, right? Diabetes is a slow, progressive disease. So think about it now, please. Think about what you're eating, don't wait. Diabetes is so freaking serious, people, so serious. And it's the major leading cause of kidney failure and kidney problems, of amputations, of blindness. Remember I said the, the um, vessels in there are really, really small. Neuropathy, which is that burning, needly pain in your legs and extremity, non-healing wound infections, that's definitely type two diabetes, not necessarily type one. And the progression of other diagnoses, heart disease and strokes, right? Diabetes is a metabolic disease. It's centered around the foods that we eat, carbohydrates, sugar, and the glycemic index but it's not a sugar problem. It's an insulin problem, right? How are you gonna get that food into your cells? It's not a problem with sugar. I'm gonna say it again, only because that's what you eat is a problem with insulin. And insulin problems are caused because you have a diet that is too high, <clears throat> excuse me, in carbohydrates and sugar. Now carbohydrates, complex and simple, turn to sugars really, really quickly. And that's what people go with, right? And the most common diabetic treatment, you guys know, insulin injections. I don't know if I could ever give myself a shot, oh my goodness, to help the sugar get into your cells. Your pancreas can't make it, so you can give it to yourself and it will help the cells work better. Or you take medications by mouth that will stimulate your pancreas to work if it still can. Sometimes it can't. And if it's working really hard trying to burn those sugars, it's not going to last very long. I'm just letting you know, right? Your heart is only a muscle too. It can only last so long. Diabetes should be treated with a great diet initially and continuously along with the prescribed medications that your doctor gives you. Remember, he can't just give you stuff if you're not taking care of yourself on this end of it. They can only do so much for us, right? So what are the, some of the reasons that the glucose can't get into the cell? Low insulin, body's not recognizing it, why? Because the receptor cells are blocked, maybe because of inflammation, right? That's swelling, or toxins in the blood, toxins in the pancreas, or the pancreas doesn't make enough insulin to cover the carbohydrates, right? Either way, the sugar would build up in the blood. You can feel dizziness, you can be really thirsty, you can be sweaty, all sorts of things. If my sugar's high, how do I feel? If my sugar's low, how do I feel? Especially if you're a diabetic, you and your family better know those symptoms. If your sugar starts getting low, they need to know what to do. Absolutely look it up and comment below and make sure that your family knows what's going on. So if the sugar levels are high in your body and they're not absorbed, guess what? The message to your brain is not received, right? This causes your body to make more insulin. All it knows is that there's sugar everywhere. So make more insulin to compensate for the sugar floating around. It's a huge, vicious cycle. So if you're not sensitive to your own insulin, which means it's produced, 
but you can't use it for whatever reasons going on. Is it your genetics? Or is it your habits growing up? Or your lifestyle as an adult? Who knows? It's probably a mixture of all three of those things, right? Like I said before, type two is probably not from genetics. Only three to 10% of diseases and illness is from genetics. The rest of it is from your lifestyle. And if your lifestyle's not right, that can change the phenome, phenome, excuse me, and then you can get that disease and illness. Your lifestyle, your inputs. Insulin resistance also leads to liver problems, right? Insulin resistance in the brain leads to the development of Alzheimer's disease. In Alzheimer's disease, some thoughts are that the brain could not receive the primary fuel because your brain loves sugar, loves glucose, not sugar, got to call it glucose, and your brain loves ketones and your brain, brain loves cholesterol also. But with Alzheimer's disease, the brain cannot receive the primary fuel glucose, glucose excuse me, because of the plaques and the plaques form on the, on the um, nerves and the vessels, and then you don't get the impulse there or you don't get the message. So your brain can't keep up also. Diabetes leads to a lot of problems in our body. If you're changing things, please make sure you keep track of your blood sugar levels more often. If you're no, used to doing it three or four times a day, you might want to do it four or five, six times a day. That way you just know, you know what your sugar level is because if you're changing your fuel or you're changing your workouts, you got to start and move very, very slowly with the change in the input and a change in your activity levels. You can't just jump in and do it, right? Okay, so let's talk about what the insulin does and how, how it actually works, okay? So insulin, I'm calling your, your special sugar-placing hormone <laughs> that's made in your pancreas. All foods stimulate insulin production, but the main culprits, like I said before, are sugar and carbs. And I know I'm repeating a lot of stuff, but that's how we learn. Repetition, right? So sugar and carbs are the key drivers to insulin spikes. With the rise in sugar or in glucose levels from the foods that you're eating or the drinks that you're drinking, it triggers an increase in the insulin levels from your pancreas. Insulin pushes the glucose into your cells, so we have energy. So we're not tired, so we're not moody, moody right? It gets all the sugar out of your bloodstream, which, are, which it, where it doesn't need to be, so you can live and you can get up and do things, right? So again, eating carbohydrates and sugar increases the insulin levels in our body, which actually leads us to the desire to eat more and eat more calories because the insulin's working, sugar's going in your cells. What are we gonna do now? Ooh, we need to eat more, right? Even if you're full, you just don't know it, especially if you're eating the fake sugars. Insulin also signals the kidneys to hold on to water and salt. So if you eat carbs, you're generating more insulin. And then you're gonna retain water and salt also. So if you actually reduce your carbohydrate consumption, your sugar consumption, you're gonna lower your insulin levels, also resulting in less retention of salt and water. Insulin also influences the way that we metabolize our food. One of the insulin's main actions is to shut down fat metabolism, like I said before. Insulin helps us determine whether we're going to burn that fat or burn those carbohydrates to meet our energy needs. And it ultimately determines whether we are going to store that extra subcutitious stuff. Subcutitious, I gotta stop saying that word. Whether we're going to store extra subcutitious right in our bodies. Absolutely. Too many carbs. Too much sugar gives us too much insulin and it tells your body to store fat. Absolutely it does. Look it up, comment below. And don't forget to love, like, subscribe, and share. 
next month is going to be a totally different um, aspects of podcasts. We're not going to talk about too many bad things. I just need a break from everything, right? So this is the last one on sugar and insulin problems for a little while. Okay, so do I need to say that again? <laughs> too much sugar, too much insulin, store extra sub-Q tissue. And like I said, then it makes you hungry and you're going to eat before you're supposed to. It's a vicious cycle, huge cycle. High insulin levels because of the food that you're eating, because you don't want a lot of insulin floating around in your cell, in your body also. They're key factors for heart disease and high blood pressure. Too much insulin also inhibits the release of growth hormones. And if your growth hormones can't get out there, it in turn depresses your immune system. It's a vicious cycle and it doesn't just affect one body system. All body systems work together. What are you feeding it? What's your fuel? One aspect of diabetes now or sugar problems now that many doctors are discussing is how well your liver is functioning. So it's not just your pancreas. No, it's not just your pancreas. All the organs work together, especially in the digestive system, right? And your digestive system is your immune system, right? That's your immune system. When your insulin levels are very low because you haven't eaten, your blood sugar is actually going to start to rise. So your liver will help out the body until you can actually eat something, right? Glycogen. It does take a little bit of time for that to happen. So if your sugars are low, you better have something there that you can bring your sugar up if you're a diabetic. Also, breaking down proteins eventually will turn to sugar. It just takes a little bit more time, right? Because your insulin is only really going to work with sugar and carbohydrates. Like I said, you better know if your blood sugar is low and what you're going to do about it. And your family or your girlfriend or your friends better know that you're a diabetic and what to expect if your sugar gets low because it can go very, very quickly depending on what you're doing that doing at that time, right? You get sweaty, you get confused, you get really thirsty, your heart rate gets fast. You kind of act like you're a drunk person and you haven't been drinking any alcohol. You and your family better know what to do in those, in those cases. If not, look it up and make sure that they know. So diabetic diets are based on what we can do to get the sugar, the good glucose, our fuel into the cells so we can use them for energy. All the diets are pretty much based on sugar, starches, and the glycemic index. And that came out in the early 80s, 1981, around there, right? So the glycemic index shows, basically just shows you how fast the food that you eat raises your blood sugar up. So we always talk about pasta because now you can have gluten-free pasta, right? So look it up if you don't, if you don't understand gluten, okay? So remember, the food actually starts melting in your mouth because we have enzymes in our saliva. And if it does start breaking down in your mouth, pretty much anything with white flour, white anything, white sugar, um, breads, some fruits, if they start breaking up in your mouth, it's probably a sugar. Absolutely. Protein doesn't really break down. Fat might. But if it starts breaking down in your mouth, it is a sugar. The genetic altering of grains today because they're not made the same, they have a higher gluten content, which means more sugar. Even if you buy the whole grains with the husks on, it's still a lot of gluten in there, okay? Most people buy the refined kind, which is just like, poop, straight sugar, poor body, oh my goodness. The grains should be actually eaten in moderation. If you overcook pasta and you overcook rice, so, you know, rice is sticky, you like the sticky rice and pasta. I like mine, you know, a little bit to the bite. Um, it's called al dente. But if you overcook them, that actually increases the starch. It'll start to gel and it starts to swell. And then it boosts its glycemic index, which means it's going to raise your sugar very quickly. Um, like I said, you can cook the, al pa the pasta al dente, which means to the tooth. And it's a little bit better as far as the spikes in sugar because it has a lower glycemic index. You didn't cook it till it started getting jelly and sticky, right? That's sugar, right? 
So now you can find pasta and probably rice is on even now in all kind of forms, especially no gluten. Oh, I'm gluten sensitive. Pretty much everybody is, right? Just like dairy sensitive, everybody's intolerant. So high glycemic foods, you guys already know them. I'll name some, bread, cookies, any kind of baked goods, our cereals, hello, rice, grains, bananas, pineapples, raisins, melons, pumpkin, papaya, mango. Of course, all sweets, potatoes, carrots, sweet potatoes, beets, beer, and wine. <laughs> They're all gonna raise your sugar. They're all gonna raise your sugar and a lot of those have a high glycemic index. Now, some foods will actually lower your glycemic variability in certain high glycemic foods. So if you're going to eat pasta that has high glycemia, then you can maybe add a little bit of this to your meal that I found um, in one of the books that I read. I'm not sure. Um, cinnamon, fennel seed, apple cider vinegar. Make sure you don't do that on an empty stomach or make sure you mix it with something. Water and lemon. All these actually produce a high fiber and it helps your glycemic not spike your index not spike up that fast these foods actually slow the increase of the blood sugar level in your body Yay! and if you chew it slowly and you mix your food with saliva the enzymes it'll actually help digest it it starts your digestion in the mouth that's why they say chew it slow not so you choke on that food it's so you help your digestive system because that's where it all starts right in your mouth breaking down the chunks of food before it gets into your tummy right if you eat in this manner you can get fewer sugar spikes and you can stay more sensitive to your insulin right your body's making it to help you out and you're not even recognizing it at some points but you know what you can change anything so don't despair please don't despair um, your hormonal system responds to every kind of sugar too whether it's fake or whether it's real and your hormones control pretty much every aspect and every system that's that you have in your body. So insulin is a hormone, right? So any kind of sugar that you eat, fake sugar, real sugar, it makes your pancreas pump out more insulin. Your, your pancreas has no idea. Your body does not know if it's a fake sugar or if it's a real sugar, right? So now we know that eating sugars or starches raises your blood sugar levels and increases your insulin production. You can't say that you don't know now, please. You can't say. These are some hormones by themselves that raise or change your blood sugar levels, right? So you can get higher glucose levels right before you start your period, right before you have your menses, right? Um, inflammation in the body for whatever reason also increases your sugar levels. Illness or diseases raises your steroid hormone, which could increase your glucose level. Exercise, oh yes, exercise, especially intense and vigorous workouts. It breaks down your muscle, which converts to sugar or glucose, right? So that also increases your glucose level. But if you do gentle exercises, it actually lowers your glucose level, right? You don't always have to do big old workouts, right? You can do gentle exercises too and stretch at the same time. Chemo and radiation also increase your glucose levels. Poor sleep increases your glucose level. So cortisol is the, ster is the, is the steroids. Cortisol is the hormone that helps you wake up. So if you're trying to wake up in the morning, you have to increase your glucose and release it in your body so your body can use it, right? Increases your sugar. Stress in the body. Adrenaline and cortisol triggers the manufacture of glucose. So it's not just the food that you eat. It's also your hormones working with you. One attribute to progressive diseases today, like diabetes, dementia, Arthritis, cancer, heart disease is a high level of this hormone, cortisone. That's our stress hormone. That's what wakes you up in the morning. That's what tells your, your, um, your body that we need sugar so we can get out of bed. Cortisone, the stress hormone. Are any, is anybody stressed out out there? Comment below. What is it doing to your body? If your, quarter, if your cortisol levels stay high for a long time, it's chronic. 
right? Six months or so stress. Our stress levels have been cray cray for a couple of years now, right? So what are you going to do different? If you have high levels of cortisol in your body for whatever reason, whatever you're stressed out about, and you eat a diet, a diet of carbohydrates and sugar, that could cause the insulin resistance that we talked about a little bit earlier. Excuse me. It could cause chronic inflammation that we talked about earlier and in other podcasts also. And it could cause increased oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is what helps us get, is linked to over 200 diseases and illnesses, right? Stress is the number one toxic, silent killer. Who's stressed out there? I am a little bit. I'm trying to really, really work on it. How about you? Comment below. Please comment below. If your cells cannot produce enough energy for you to live healthy, to use up the sugar and the carbs and the fuel that you're putting into your body with insulin, it increases the production of free radicals. Free radicals will destroy your cells and increase your oxidative stress. With the accumulation of oxidative stress in your body, it could add many, many diagnoses to your medical file and you could age faster. Watch my podcast on oxidative stress. That was one of the first things that I learned when I started um, teaching about anti-aging and pre-prevention. Oxidative stress, what is that? Well, I had no idea, now I do, but you know what? It's associated still with the fuel that we put in our body. I'd said this before, because of the American diet, one out of two people have a serious sugar problem. I'm not saying diabetes, but one out of two people have a a sugar problem, right? This could lead to diabetes. And diabetes is one of the leading causes of heart attacks and strokes. It's written in many, many places. 30% of the United States is overweight. 40% are obese. That means a BMI greater than 30, right? 30, 30 million people have type 2 diabetes. And that's just what's in the books for right now. And that's not this year either. And 88 million have pre-diabetes, 88 million. And 84 million people are on the cusp of the triad. And I said this in one of my other meetings because they have a much higher BMI. And the triad is high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and high sugar. And that includes our children. Don't forget our children. They're the main reasons I do all this. Even if you're not a a diabetic, uneven blood sugar levels throughout the day and throughout the night because you're eating and drinking too much sugar will still cause cellular inflammation inflammation and and insulin resistance. You don't even have to be a diabetic. And if your sugars fluctuate all day, what you're eating, you're gonna be in trouble. All those will lead to problems associated with the American people today. Diabetes, cancers, dementia, heart disease. Yes, it's our input. It really is our input. High fasting blood sugars cause greater damage too to the parts of your brain. So fasting sugar is what they take before you have any food or anything in your body. What's your sugar levels run when you're not digesting food, right? The hippocampus in the brain is associated with dementia, right? Elevated sugar levels can also give people fatty liver it's not just alcohol right it's a sugar and too many sugar and carbohydrates will raise your cholesterol level your triglyceride level it's not from eating fat remember it's normal for your liver to can to contain some fat but if the fat level gets too high your liver can no longer regulate your blood sugar yes it's your pancreas but your liver does so much Fat gets stored in your liver, like I said before, in the form of triglycerides. High triglycerides are not made from eating fat. They're made from eating too many carbohydrates and too much sugar. And alcohol, actually. Alcohol is a carb, so that's going to get stored in the body as a triglyceride too, right? You got to be careful. You got to look this stuff up. Don't you want to be healthy? Don't you want to be healthy? 
so many things raise your cholesterol levels, so many things raise your sugar, but you can change it. Otherwise, your waist level is going to get bigger. You are going to gain weight. And then your organs are eventually going to say, that's it, mama. I don't feel good anymore. We're going to have to go see the doctor. This is not good. You do not want your liver unhappy. It does so many things for you. You don't want your pancreas unhappy. It does so many things for you. If you're diabetic type 1, you have to be really, really careful because your body, for the most part, does not make any insulin at all. Please work with your doctor. Read the books. Remember, there are many, many names of sugar. Fed Up is on Netflix, and it actually names most of the fake sugars. Please know them. Look it up. Write it down in your little special book that you got, okay? Remember that your insulin might be desensitized because of all the different types of sugar that you're eating and drinking, right? In 1939, around that date, is when the company started adding sugar to our cereals. That was a long time ago. What are the sugars in our foods now? Mm. In the 1970s is actually when big food companies and the FDA and the government actually started talking about sugar. But they were saying, and they're talking about sucrose, the white sugar, refined sugar, so it's not good for you either. They're saying that it was good for you. It helps you grow. It's only 15 calories. It's not bad for you. It boosts your energy. Now they know different. They don't say those things anymore. What do they say now? There's no added sugar in there when there actually is. They're putting the fake sugars in there and it still does the same thing for your body. Whether you're a diabetic or whether you're not a diabetic, it doesn't matter. Change your source of fuel. Keep good control of it. Know what's going on with your body and tell your doctor what is going on. Right? Please watch my, my lectures for this month. Sugar, high fructose corn syrup, and last week was fake sugars. That was a hard one, like I said before. Those words, those words were hard to say, huh? But they're made in a lab. Mm -mm. Use other sugar. There's other things. Food companies are required actually to list everything. But small amounts of sugar, they don't have to. They can put a star there. And fake sugars, they don't have to. They're hidden in plain sight at the bottom of the nutrition labels. And we just don't know what those words are. Eventually, I will have a label lecture, a label podcast, um, and I'll probably have to break that up because you know how many labels I've been saving from all sorts of foods from everybody's homes for a couple of years? Yeah, I have a whole bunch of them, so I kind of need to separate them, but I'll help you. I, I will teach you what those words are, but look up Fed Up on Netflix. They, they explain all of them. If it's on there anymore, I'm sure you'll be able to find it, F-E-D and then up. Packaged foods are manufactured to create the fastest Glucose spike and the steepest crash. Get your energy, feel good, go down. So why? Why does that happen? So you'll eat again. So you'll eat sooner than you would have if you actually ate a healthy snack, right? And then you're going to need more insulin. you got to keep track of what your sugar is. I've actually had patients tell me, oh, I can eat the ice cream. I said, you're a diabetic. Oh, it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll just take more insulin. My doctor says it's okay. No, they don't. I don't believe that they say it's okay. What? I kind of believe you, and then I kind of don't believe you. Your doctor is not going to tell you to have something sweet and just take more insulin. It's still going to cause so many problems. Okay, yeah, you, you got some more insulin, and your sugar's going into your cell. What do you think it's doing to you? to your organs, to your systems. Look it up, I've already told you. Check out the foods that you're eating in a hospital. Check out the foods that you're eating in the rehab center. How many sugars or carbohydrates are on your plate? The simple carbs are gonna get burnt up quicker, just like eating a piece of candy. How many starches are on your plate? Which foods actually start to melt in your mouth, right? <sighs> I don't think your doctors told you to do that. And if they did, oh my goodness, I just don't know what to say. And that's bad if I don't know what to say. Think about the brain right now. The human brain needs fat and cholesterol for, for proper functioning, right? And the fuel can either be glucose or ketones. 
It prefers glucose because it's quick, but you can also use ketone. The brain loves sugar. It loves glucose. It loves ketones and cholesterol, right? It's not just sugar. And I was always say, oh, the brain only uses sugar. No, it doesn't. Mm -mm -mm. Your brain uses most of the energy from your body systems. 20% of your body's energy is used just in the brain. So it's very important that you get the right fuel there, right? The brain also uses ketone metabolism when you're surviving or when you're fasting or when you're on that diet. But we're going to think of another word for diet. I don't like that word. When we do my diet lectures, I will think of a different word for that one. If you have ketones as your fuel, ketones actually lower inflammation levels, so that's good. Ketones can provide fuel for the brain and it reduces the production of insulin because it's not sugar. Insulin and sugar go together. Ketones can get into your system in other ways. Insulin is made if you eat carbs and eat sugar. So if you don't eat too many carbs and sugar, you don't need to produce that much insulin, right? Keep track of it. Please learn what foods and drinks and different sugars do to your blood sugar level. You need to check your blood sugar level if you're changing anything so much more often. Keep track of it, write it down, and let your doctor know, guess, guess what I'm doing, right? If you're not a diabetic and you eat foods and you don't know what your blood sugar levels are and you don't have a machine because you're not diabetic, how do you feel after you eat? How do you feel about an hour or so after you eat, right? If you change some sources of your food fuel slowly but surely so you can keep track like I said you need to check your sugars a lot more often until your sugar levels are stable right and again you need to let your practitioner know what you're doing you can't do this by yourself just like they can't take care of you by yourself by their selves you need to kick in also right If you do eat sugar, it should be eaten by itself. And I'm talking about desserts. If you do eat sugar, it should be eaten by itself. God sugar, which is fruit, right? It should be eaten by itself. And then in about 30 minutes or so, then you can have a meal because it gets broken up really, really quickly, right? Even if you're a diabetic or you don't have diabetes, your fruit and your sugars are gonna get burned up quickly. Even if you have the skin on it. Now the skin is gonna be the fiber. So if you eat a sugar with fiber, then it actually takes less time for the sugar to get into your system. It kind of slows everything down, right? If you do eat dessert, try not to do it on an empty stomach. You know why? Because it's gonna make you want something else afterwards. If you eat dessert on an empty stomach, but still, wait about 30 minutes after your meal before you have that dessert. And you know what? Your body might not even want it after that. You, you just, you won't crave it. So you might not get that dessert if you wait, right? Remember that cycle. Remember that cycle. And if you are a diabetic, you better eat a good dessert for you, right? And I'm not gonna even name what those are. You should know better. And if you are a diabetic, help somebody out. Comment below on what your favorite diabetic dessert is. But first, turn it around, read that label, and see what's in there. So to repeat, eating carbs raises your blood sugar or your glucose level, which triggers your pancreas to increase your insulin levels in your body so you can use that sugar. Insulin, the hormone, pushes the glucose into your cells out of the bloodstream so you can have energy so you can get up and move around, so you can take a test, so you can laugh, so you can walk outside, right? The insulin in the body causes your blood sugar levels to drop. When that happens, you have the desire to eat more. And if you're eating sugar, starchy foods, sugar-filled foods, because now you can read the labels, right? And you can look at the back, you're gonna eat more and you're gonna eat sooner. That cycle, that cycle. Too many carbs, too much sugar, too much insulin, too much insulin, you store fat, you're not gonna burn it, and too much insulin makes you hungry before you're supposed to be. 
a vicious cycle again. So what are you going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? When I was pregnant, I had gestational diabetes. And they said, if you don't watch what, what your input is, Kathy, and you don't watch your lifestyle, like I said, my son's almost 21 now, you're going to be a diabetic when you get older. Because my dad was a diabetic and my grandmother, diabetic type 2. I changed my lifestyle. Thank goodness. Thank goodness I was able to change my lifestyle, right? It was scary there for a minute. What do you mean I'm going to be a diabetic? No. Change your lifestyle. So some carbs are good for you. It has to be the right amount and it has to be the right kind. Okay? Even if you're not a diabetic, remember, fluctuating blood sugar levels all day causes inflammation throughout your whole body and all your body systems. And then it could eventually cause insulin resistance, right? And insulin resistance could lead to diabetes type 2, cancerous heart disease, blocking off of your blood vessels, right? That's not good. If you're not a diabetic, you can still answer all these questions. How do you feel during the day? How do you feel after you eat? How do you feel after you eat a certain meal? Are you tired some of the time? Do you have to have that afternoon nap or that afternoon coffee because you're slumping down? Sometimes you have a lot of energy and sometimes you don't. Are you moody? Are you grumpy? If you don't think so, ask your spouse. They will definitely tell you. Guess what? That could possibly mean that your blood sugar is off. It could mean that you're sensitive to sugar. It could mean that you're a pre-diabetic. It could mean that you're starting to have insulin resistance. You might want to be careful of all the sugars and the sugar producing foods that are in your diet. If you feel any of these ways and please comment below. Absolutely. How do you feel in the morning and then mid morning and then lunch and then afternoon and before you go to bed, right? Slowly cut those things down. Go with the low sugar fruits if you can, if you need something sweet like that, right? Then see how you feel throughout the day. This could also help your pancreas rest, right? Be careful of alcohol also, right? You don't need it every day. It turns right to sugar. If you're diabetic, definitely be careful of alcohol because the way the alcohol is digested or processed in your body, it can actually lower your blood sugar, right? Diabetes or not diabetes, if you drink alcohol, you kind of wake up in the middle of the night when, that, when the alcohol level goes down in your body, whether it's to go to the bathroom or not, still you wake up in the, night because, in the middle of the night because your blood sugars are all over the place from the alcohol that you ate and you usually eat it when you're eating food too. You usually drink it, excuse me, when you're eating food too. So that kind of messes everything up, right? If you're diabetic, you also have to be careful of what you put in your alcohol drink. Are you gonna burn that up really quickly, right? Are you gonna lose your blood sugar in the middle of the night when you're sleeping, Mr. Diabetic, Mrs. Diabetic? That's not a good thing if your blood sugars get too low when you're sleeping and nobody else is around, okay? The mixtures, the fake sugars, the real sugars, they still increase your blood sugar level, okay? And then you could drop your sugar really, really quickly. So what are you doing at that time that you could drop your sugar really quickly? Are you walking on the side of the road? Are you driving a car? Are you by yourself? Are you taking care of your children, your little children? What are you going to do? Write it down. Make sure that your family knows what to do if your blood sugars are low. And even if your blood sugars aren't low and you have those signs and symptoms that I said earlier, if you eat a little bit of sugar and you don't get better, it's going to raise it a little bit more. Who cares? But a low blood sugar, you're going to be in trouble. This is a family affair. Diabetes is a family affair. Cancer is a family affair. It's not just about you. And it's not just about your practitioner. Everybody has to work together. 
If you drink alcohol and you're a diabetic and you haven't eaten, your blood sugar might already be low. So be careful because you get that spike of the alcohol whenever you mix it in and then boom, it makes your blood sugar lower. Hypoglycemia, that's not good because that can lead to shock. That is not good. If you're gonna drink alcohol and you're a diabetic, you better eat something that is gonna last for a long time. That means no starch, no sugars, no fried foods because that is sugar and you use them up really, really fast. You need to have protein. You need to have something that is gonna take a little bit of time to break down into your body, right? Because the, the liver is actually gonna start breaking down the alcohol right away and forget about the sugars and then everything goes down. Remember, if you're changing your diet at all and you're a diabetic and you're doing anything else that you haven't been doing, you need to start out very, very slow. You need to keep track of your meals. You need to keep track of the times that you're eating. You need to keep track of how you feel and your moods after you've exercised or eaten this specific kind of meal. And you know, need to know what your blood sugar is at all times. Like I said earlier in the podcast, if you're used to checking your blood sugar three or four times a day and you're slowly kind of cutting out the sugars that your body is used to using for fuel, you better make sure that your sugar levels are okay, right? You better check them more times a day until you are stable. And what else do I always say? You got to tell your doctor. You got to tell your practitioner what you are doing, okay? Blood sugar levels, 70 to 120 is about the right levels, right? If it's less than 70, you better eat something, okay? If you're a diabetic and, it's, and you're less than 70, you might want to have something that works a little bit faster, like a juice or a piece of fruit, okay? But then you need to eat a healthy meal, because like I said, those get burned up really quickly, okay? So 70 to 120, if it's less than 70, you need to eat a healthy meal, okay? And you know what's good for you. We've already talked about what's good for you. And anything else that's good for you, please comment below. Teach me, teach me, okay? Check your sugar and write it down. Keep good track of it, okay? The way that I learned how to do it, like I said, I'm not a diabetic, but the way that I learned to cook and change my input, I just got a couple great cookbooks, okay? And they're written by diabetics, they're written by doctors who want great health, okay? Comment below your favorite cookbook. And that's, and after you just kind of read it, you, you read it as if it's a book because they have a lot of good tidbits too, right? How to cook rice correctly, how to do this correctly, and then it's going to be easier for you to cook because you already know how to do it. It might take a little bit of time at first, but it's going to work out better in the end because you're going to be able to cook a variety of food that's great for you and your family, okay? Please, please, please buy the cookbooks. Learn it up. Get it at thriftbooks.com. I'm sure they have cookbooks in there also. I probably have bought some from there, not just my regular books. And then read it. Like I said, read it like a regular book and learn how to cook something different, okay? You know what's right for you. Now there's more things that are right for you, right? I hope you decide to learn and grow and choose health for you. Choose health for your family, okay? Symptoms of diabetes that you should be checked out by your practitioner, okay? That you, that you might not know you're a diabetic besides the moods and how you feel. Um, increased thirsty, you're really, really thirsty, you're peeing a lot, your breath is sweet, and that's not from alcohol, you're kind of tired all the time, maybe some irritation, your skin tone kind of looks translucent, um, you, can, you lose weight, you're hungry all the time, and like I said, diabetics type 2, they have wounds that just don't heal, please tell your practitioner, you need to go get checked out, you need to get checked out, okay? Simple carbs, the fastest times that get into your system, juices, alcohol, refined grains, refined sugar, juicy, juicy fruits, milk products, starches, there's more. Comment below. Complex carbs still get turned into sugar, takes just a smidge more time, not that much. Fresh vegetables, fresh fruits, beans, natural and whole grains, see, kind of the same thing, right? The only thing that really doesn't change your sugar too much are green leafy vegetables. Yummy! And just know that the fruit and the vegetables have dietary fiber in them. That's the good part. Your microbiome loves that. 
but fiber actually gives you more time before your sugar just goes right on up. So the average person consumes about 130 pounds of sugar a year. It can add so many extra calories a day, bigger waistlines, and more diagnoses in your medical file. Five to nine teaspoons a day, that's all we're supposed to have. Nobody's getting that. If you're a diabetic, it might need, you might need even less than that. Please keep track of it. Four grams of sugar is about a teaspoon. Like I said in my sugar lecture and when I got so upset, children under the age of two or younger should not have sugar. Yes, they can have fruit, but they should not have sugar, sugar. And they still get up to maybe even more, but seven grams a day. Blood sugar levels should be between 70 and 120. If you have any of these symptoms, please have your doctor check you out. The sooner the better, right? Fasting blood sugar should be between 70 and 85. Everybody's different, but it should definitely be less than 100, okay? Milligrams per deciliter. Your body needs a balance to live. Too much sugar and fake sugars disrupt our yin and yang. Come on. It disrupts our balance. It disrupts our lives. It disrupts every aspect of our lives. Sweetness in the foods and sweetness in the drinks have been available for over a century. Watch my sugar lecture. Watch my high fructose corn syrup lecture. Watch my fake sugar lecture. Not everything needs sugar put in it. Please, big food companies, we're asking, we're begging you, help us be healthier. Yes, to be the people like you're doing and you're doing such a good job, but get the sugar out, please. Too many people are getting sick, too many. The highest form of influence over another person is moral authority. Walk that walk before you talk. Walk that walk before you sell us something that is not good for us. And now you can't say that you don't know it either. We have to work together. Please, my loves, learn what different foods and different um, drinks do to your sugars in your body, okay? How do you feel after you eat? How do you feel about an hour after you eat? Keep good track and let your doctor know again what you are doing. Just think about what can be changed for the better. Just think about what can be resolved by changing your input slowly. You will be healthier in some way. I can't say what way, but you will be healthier in some way. I promise you just need to change some sources of your fuel slowly but surely, like I said, I learned how to cook and eat differently because I bought those cookbooks because I had no idea. I don't eat meat too often, so I had to get, you know, vegan and vegetarian cookbooks too. How am I going to get my protein? How am I going to get my B12? How am I going to get my selenium? How am I going to get the stuff that you only get from animal products? Now I know, and I read those books. Did you know that I was cooking brown rice wrong this whole time? Whole grain, organic brown rice, you're supposed to saute like mom used to do with rice aroni. I use coconut oil, a little bit of Himalayan pink salt, saute it till it starts turning brown and getting that nutty, yummy kind of burnt flavor, burnt smell. Then you add the water. It totally changes the way your brown rice tastes. I did not know that. And I actually mix my whole grain brown rice with purple rice. I think it's black rice, but it changes everything purple, so I'm just <laughs> saying purple rice, and I mix those two together. And like I said, you have to look at the how much you're actually supposed to have, which isn't that much. You don't need that many grains. It should be mostly vegetables, right? And dark green vegetables don't change your sugar as much. Peter Drucker stated, the purpose of information is not knowledge, it's being able to take the right action. Are you gonna take the right action? Just remember the information that I give you in any of these podcasts is not meant to diagnose. It's not meant to cure. It's not meant to treat any one of your diseases. You have to let your doctor and your healthcare practitioner know what you are doing, what you are doing regarding your health and wellness. Write it down, keep your journal, keep track of it. Write down how you feel, comment below how great you're feeling now. I know that you guys are doing great. I am so, so proud of you. If you have any of the symptoms that you think that you could possibly be a diabetic, please go to your doctor. 
please go to the um, health department somewhere to get those um, lab tests and those um, tests that you can do to see if you're diabetic. You need to know. Everybody needs to know what their diagnoses are. Don't be afraid. It's not a death sentence. Just like cancer is not a death sentence anymore. We are doing so great with the things that we can do for diabetes and illnesses. Everybody working together, practitioners, you, my loves, the cancer people, the pharmaceutical companies, big foods. Yes, we're all working together. And eventually it's all going to work out for the best because they don't have a choice. We don't have a choice. Too many people are stepping up now. There are other ways to be healthy than what we've learned, than what I've learned over the last 35 years. Thank you so much for listening today. So do you have a sugar problem or do you have an insulin problem? Comment below. I love you guys. Next week, we're going to talk about something that has nothing to do with nutrition for the body. Nutrition for the mind but not nutrition for the body. My name is Chatty Kathy. I love you guys so much. Thank you for listening to me today. Have a happy Wednesday. Bye.